Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In this video, we are going to be talking about feature selection. Feature selection is usually a pre-processing step used before we apply a classification or a clustering task or any other uh, machine learning based task. Uh, we are going to see why we do that, what are the common types of feature selections and what happens uh, with the data when we apply a uh, feature uh, selection uh, process uh, before we start. So, the first thing is why do we do feature selection and uh, we will see in the coming slides uh, particularly also what is the difference between a feature selection and a feature extraction and they do two different things. Why we do each of them and what is the advantage of that. Before we move on to the uh, common techniques of feature selection, uh, so we have term frequency, information gain, mutual information, chi-square, these are the basic ones there have been a lot of new feature selection techniques that are based on these or similar uh, methodology that have been published uh, published papers in recent years and then finally in the next lecture we are going to look at what is dimensionality reduction what is PCA and SVD and maybe if we have time we are also going to look at the uh, multi-dimensional scaling MDS but if we don't have time we are going to skip this and uh, look at the first two because uh, by far these are the two most used feature uh, dimension reduction techniques as compared to MDS. In this part we are going to concentrate on the information gain because again it is a very powerful technique and a lot of the new methods that have been developed are based on this information theory. So what is feature selection and why do we need feature selection or, or for that matter dimension reduction why do we need that. Uh, it is so easy and convenient to collect data. So when we are using, for instance, if we are using a digital system, uh, it is very easy to collect the data. If I am using a web page, if I am searching web page, for instance, I am Google and I am indexing all the web page, then all the data on the web page is uh, simply data for me and it is very easy for me to go and crawl those web pages and extract all the information from those web pages. But uh, is all the data useful for data mining? That is the big question because among the data that I have collected, some of it will be useful, some will not be useful and some will be downright negative uh, in whatever I am trying to do. Maybe I am trying to do clustering or classification. So some part of the data will negatively affect uh, that process that I am going to uh, do. So data accumulates in an unprecedented speed. So we have a lot of uh, ways to collect data. Data is gathering in with a lot of speed. For instance, if I'm Google again, I give you the same example. Uh, every day, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of web pages are being added. So my data keeps on increasing. My data keeps on increasing. If I'm Facebook, I'm WhatsApp. Again, every single day there are hundreds, maybe uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of new posts, new web pages, new likes, new communities, new friends, uh, WhatsApp messages. So all these are uh, ways I am gathering data and uh, they are coming at a very fast speed. So as I said feature selection or dimensional reduction, uh, we will talk about what exactly they are uh, in the next slide. But they are very good pre-processing uh, step and they are import, important part of the overall effective machine learning and data mining techniques. Uh, dimension reduction is uh, also an effective way in reducing the uh, size of the data. So what uh, before we begin what is let us differentiate between feature selection and feature extraction. The first one is feature extraction. What is feature extraction? So feature extraction is usually a pre-processing step and it is extracting something from the overall larger part of the data. So instead of using the whole data, we extract usable features that may be helpful in the classification or the learning process. And it is usually done because the whole data is uh, maybe unusable or is too large for the task we are performing. So it is not a very, it's a, uh, whatever we are doing is usually associated with the task that we are performing. So maybe we are doing unsupervised learning, maybe we are doing uh, supervised learning uh, classification. 
So I'll give you an example. Uh, for instance, if there's a picture, and instead of using the whole picture, I am trying to extract some information from the picture. So I'm going to apply image processing techniques and maybe find the texture, maybe find the color, maybe find the contours of, of, of an object, maybe detect objects and you know uh, count how many objects there are, maybe look at the size of the object, uh, maybe detect uh, certain uh, lines, certain curves or certain patterns from the picture. Uh, if I'm using a video, maybe a YouTube video, I'm going to look at uh, is it showing people, is it showing animals, is it showing a cartoon, how many objects are there, how many people, are there buildings, are there cars. So this kind of things that I'm, the whole data is going to be the entire video. So when I say that the data may be unusable, it means that if I want to make a classifier, perhaps the entire video or the entire picture uh, may be unusable. And from what we have done uh, so far, uh, maybe if I have a picture and I'm using a deep learning algorithm, maybe it's usable. But if I'm using a decision tree or I'm using a naive Bayesian classifier, then uh, the entire picture as such is not usable for me. I need to uh, extract information from uh, that uh, picture. So this is the feature extraction part and it may or may not be followed by the feature selection part. So uh, I hope it's clear what the feature extraction is. It means gaining some insight and extracting certain features. They are going to be predefined. I'm going to decide what I have to extract from the picture or video or, uh, or the sensor or maybe it's a voice data or something like that. And the second part is the feature selection. So once I have extracted the features, all the features I need, then I am going to look at uh, the features and use some calculations or some evaluation techniques to figure out if all of them are useful or not. So uh, and the objective here is uh, two things. First of all, it is to reduce the dimensionality and remove the noise. And the second one is that using sometimes using less features will lead to a better performance. Uh, better performance means better performance in terms of the speed, in terms of the accuracy, in terms of the simplicity and comprehensibility of the mind results. So here we have two examples. So there are two faces, a male and a female. And if I am to extract features from that, so what kind of features can I extract? Uh, maybe I can extract. So let's say there are multiple images here. So we have multiple images over here and multiple images over here. And so maybe I say this is my first image, image one. And then I have my image two, then my image three and so on. And so I can make a sort of a table because uh, we usually like to extract things in the form of a table. Uh, the reason being that a table is also a matrix. And once we have a matrix, there are so many things that we can do with matrices. Uh, you studied entire linear algebra for that. And it's going to be used in the in the next lecture as well. So some things I can use here. Maybe I can look at the height of the face. So maybe I can calculate uh, this distance. So the first one could be I want to extract the height. That could be one thing. And then I can have uh, the width. So I can have the width, that could be another feature. And then maybe uh, this curve, you know, if you see this curve is very different from uh, this curve. So maybe the jaw line, uh, that could be another feature. Maybe the distance between the eyes, this could be. So eye distance, this could be another feature and so on and I can have something like uh, hair length uh, that could be another feature and so on. So this denotes that there could be other features and finally uh, for every image that I have I am going to extract uh, these features. So I mentioned here this is let's say 
image one and then I have image two and so on lot of them. So what I can do is once I have done with extracting this I can also add their category. Uh, so I can say uh, this one was a male, this one was a male, this is a female, then a male, then a female, then a female and so on. So once I am done with that this part uh, what I have just done here is the feature extraction part. Once I am done with that, then I will say, okay, uh, maybe is the height important? Then I have to look at this. And the way I look at this is, does this differentiate between a male and a female? Does this differentiate between a male and a female? Maybe this, uh, maybe this, and uh, this probably does. So for each of the features, so for instance, if I have one, this is the first feature, the second feature, the third, the fourth, and maybe there are 1000 features I extracted here. So the next question is, are all the 1000 features that I extracted important? And if I knew beforehand which were important, I wouldn't have extracted the 1000 features. If I don't know which are important, then the next thing I can do is I can maybe calculate all the features and then later decide which one were the important ones and which one were the less important ones. And so this is where the feature selection is going to come. So this part extracting all the features here, this was the feature extraction. Next, if I say, okay, instead of this 1000, I am just going to keep maybe, uh, I'm just going to keep maybe 25. Now reducing this to 1000 from 1000 to 25, selecting which one to keep and which one not to keep maybe keep this maybe keep this and keep this or maybe don't keep this or don't keep this uh, so how do we get from this 1000 to this 25 this part is called the feature selection so the extraction means getting the information from the image into the tabular form and then the feature selection means reducing the number of columns or since also if you look at this this is a vector so the number of features or the number of columns are also the number of dimensions of the vector so basically i am trying to reduce the number of uh, axes that i'm going to have if i have something in two axes uh, i can plot the data like this if i have in three axes i can make a 3d if i have one thousand access that means I have to go for a thousand dimension and uh, sometimes that may not be very good thing particularly if the data is sparse if the data is sparse then if I make something in a thousand uh, dimensions uh, that means a lot of the things will be missing and uh, if I'm trying to find the distances or I'm trying to find the similarities uh, in a very large dimensional space it kind of loses its meaning. There's a term uh, for that. It's called the curse of dimensionality. This is a Y. A curse of dimensionality means that once the number of dimensions start increasing, any two values you take, uh, for instance, if uh, this is a sparse data, so maybe this was not lines, this was just something like ones and zeros and one and zero and if for instance it was something like this i'm not saying this is going to be like this but i'm saying if it was it were like this uh, then any two value taken at random will probably have the same distance or the same similarity because there are so many zeros there so you automatically start having a match when a match does not even exist and that's what's called the curse of dimensionality it said that when the number of dimensions start increasing any two data points taken at random tend to have the same distance or the same similarity so that is uh, something that is bad so a uh, curse of dimensionality is something that is bad you don't like that to happen so the that's another reason you would uh, want to apply feature selection and of course whatever you are doing any algorithm that you will be applying on a data set of size 1000 versus the same algorithm applied on a data set of size 25 maybe this one is going to be a lot more faster as well
so speed is there accuracy could be improved and comprehension is also improved so uh, these are the major reasons you would like to do feature selection so up to now what we have discussed is what's feature extraction what's feature selection or the difference between two and why we would do either one of them so let's move on to the next uh, example uh, so here we have an example from uh, uh, this is a similar example to what I was giving before uh, about a textual data. So if we have web pages or maybe documents uh, and we have a data related to that. So maybe I'm sorting from the, um, uh, you know, taking data from the internet and I can make a matrix like this. This is the standard form of representing a text data. It's called a, a vector space model vsm in this uh, all the documents are in the rows all the terms or the words are in the columns and if this term occurs in this document uh, maybe it occurs 12 times so i'm going to write a 12 this term does not occur here so i'm going to write a zero and this term occurs a six times so we have here and then we have the category just like in the previous slides move on to the second document uh, see if this term occurs so all the terms will have individually a column and uh, so maybe this term t1 here is uh, for instance let's say this is school so i'm going to go and scan this document whenever i find uh, school i'm going to come here and increment it by one read it again find another school increment here and uh, so on and so uh, this is done by hashing so since when i'm reading the first uh, document i don't know how many terms there are going to be in total so i'm just going to use some kind of a hash function so when i find school i put it here uh, if i go to the second uh, document if i find school it's going to hash to the same place and um, for the second document i have uh, this one because here is the second document and if it's a new uh, word that have not occurred here i'm just going to add it here so at the end, I am going to end up with a matrix. This is going to be a matrix. Uh, this is the matrix. Uh, so this is the matrix. And I'm going to end up with the matrix whose uh, rows are M, where M is the number of documents, and whose columns are N, where N is the total number of different words that occurred in the entire collection of documents. So all the vocabulary set in all the documents combined, that is N. And so you can see from here that one document will contain only a very small subset of words. So this uh, matrix is going to be highly sparse. So uh, you can connect this with what we're talking about in the last slide regarding the, uh, the curse of dimensionality. So this is going to be a highly, uh, highly sparse matrix uh, usually it's going to be a very highly sparse matrix so the task is to classify uh, so suppose i'm not given uh, these uh, labels and i'm or i'm giving the labels for the training data and i want to classify for the test data so i have to uh, classify the test data so if a data is given maybe 0 9 so on and 5 and there's a question mark here which category does it belong to this document is it a sports document is talking about traveling it's about jobs or anything else and the challenge here i have is that for a reasonable sized uh, collection of documents so a collection of documents is called a corpus for a reasonable sized corpus i may end up with hundreds of thousands of words so in other words the size of my document uh, my, my matrix here can be uh, more than a hundred thousand maybe half a million so uh, the first thing is you know getting that matrix just loading that matrix is going to be a huge task and then a lot of the matrix is actually zeros because it's a highly sparse matrix but this is a standard form it doesn't have to be uh, document uh, terms it can be anything for instance and in, we had the play tennis so that was also in the form of a matrix it was exactly the same thing uh, so it doesn't have to be exactly uh, doesn't have to be documents and terms it can be 
uh, anything that can be represented as a matrix. So, what's the solution? The solution is to reduce this from hundreds of thousands to maybe a few thousand or maybe a few hundred uh, depending on how uh, much are, uh, words are necessary uh, to uh, be able to classify all these documents. So, a large document collection may contain uh, millions of words. So, it means that each individual vector is going to have millions of dimensions and just like we said in the previous slide that you know the algorithms will not work or uh, if we have curse of dimensionality it means any two documents will have the same similarity because you know the entire thing is filled with zeros a very few ones or uh, non zero elements there. So, the first thing we do is that we remove what is known as stop words. So, stop words are words that do not really help you to classify between travel or science or religion. For instance, things like at, to, the, uh, is, he and so on. There are in English there are I think 512 commonly used stop words. Uh, it means that knowing that document one has at or to or the will not help you to say this is document belongs to science category or travel category because all documents are equally likely to have this. Uh, as opposed to that if for instance I have something like uh, cricket football or um, maybe tennis and uh, or I have about maybe uh, what can I say I have Einstein I have curve or okay let's look at cure or I have uh, any other thing maybe the word physics. So, these words are very helpful in classifying because if I have a document with these words I know it is talking about sports and I have a document with these words I know it is talking about science. But if I have the document with these words I am not sure because uh, they can be equally likely in either of the categories. So, uh, this is an example of uh, for instance this document belongs to medicine it has these set of uh, words. Uh, this document and again belongs to medicine and so on and we have 10 documents and the last one belongs to environment and it has these kind of words. So, what we can do is uh, as a very rough and very basic feature selection technique. Uh, what I can do is I can rank the words. So, I can say ok nuclear how many times nuclear occurs in the entire uh, corpus, how many times project occurs. So, we can see project over here. I do not see project here, I do not see project here, but I see project over here as well. So, there is current over here, there is current over here, there is current here and there is current here. So, current occurs in all the documents. So, I can just have ok current occurs 9 times, project occurs 7 times. So, what I can do is that we might now set the threshold to 2. So, I am saying that if a word occur too few times. So, even if it was a discriminative word, it was a very useful word, but because it does not occur a lot of time, it is not going to help me at all uh, or not at all, but it is not going to help me significantly to improve my uh, classification that I am trying to do. So, maybe if I uh, put a threshold of 2 and all the words that are uh, occurring less than 2 are deleted, then from 118 words, I am left with just uh, 20. Uh, 9 words. So, 75 percent of the words have been deleted just by using this threshold value of 2. But this is an arbitrary value. So, I do not know maybe I deleted some of the very good uh, words. When I say good it means uh, basically word for me is helpful in discriminating uh, between the classes. So, any word that can help in discriminate is a good or uh, and any one that does not help is a, is a bad or a useless word for me. So, that was the basic uh, that is a very basic and this is totally unsupervised. I did not need to know the, uh, the the classes of anything. I just you know use this threshold and uh, ended up rejecting 75 percent of the words. 
the next one is a proper feature selection technique and this is used for the supervised learning so here what i can do is uh, just like in the id3 algorithm i calculated the entropy of each feature and then decided which one to go with first uh, at the root node what i can do is for every word i can calculate the information again uh, resulting from that word and after that i can select those words that have high information gain and then reject those words that have low information gain as you know that information gain was the entropy before and the entropy after so in this case it's going to be with and without the classes so this is the formula for the information gain t is the term or the word that i want to calculate whether this word is useful or not g is for the gain or maybe we can use ig here and m is the number of classes ci is the class and uh, t is the term not t is meaning the term does not occur so t means the term occurs and not t means the term does not occur and these are all probabilities and condition properties they are the same conditional properties that we used in markov chain markov models and naive bayesian classifier so you can see the same probability of uh, conditional properties are occurring over and over again in different algorithms and different formula so let's take this example so the first two documents belong to the category c uh, can be anything and the next three documents means not c it means there are two categories c and not c or i can call them c1 and this is this is one b c1 c1 and c2 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 so if i have two categories i can just use c and not c if i had more than two i could have said c1 c2 and c3 if i had more than uh, two so uh, these are the words so we have cat 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 dog cat dog mouse and so on so uh, this is a toy example to illustrate how we are going to calculate the mutual from uh, sorry the information gain on the terms and then decide which term to keep and which one to discard so uh, i've kept the example on the right side for reference now let's look at the so we have, if you look here we have to calculate the probability of c probability of c given t and c given not t in addition to that the probability of t independently and not t independently so the term occurring independently versus the uh, the category uh, the, the conditional probability that the category occurs given the term so looking at this one what's the probability of t so if i take the first t to be cat what's the probability of the word cat to occur there are two ways i can do it i can either count the occurrence of cat as one or i can count the frequency or the number of times that uh, this word occur so in other words i can say uh, this document contains cat yes no yes that's one or i can say yeah it contains the word cat and it occurs, occurs three times so i'm basically emphasizing the number of times this word occurs in the document so depending on which uh, way i am using if somebody asks me what's the probability of cat so if i'm using the first way that means i'm just counting the occurrence of cat yes yes or no so cat occurs in document 1 yes in document 2 yes in document 3 yes in document 4 yes in document 5 no so out of the five document cat occurs in four of the documents so the probability of cat is 4 by 5 if i use the other way then i'm going to count how many times it occurs and count all the uh, uh, words that are occurring so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 cat occurs 10 times and in total there are 17 words so what's the probability of cat occurring it is 10 by 17 so you can use either one of them but whichever you decide to use you have to be consistent throughout uh, the entire algorithm so that's the probability of t what's the probability of not t so if i use the first method i'm uh, for the rest of the slides and for the rest of the lecture i'm going to be using 
the first method. So for me, if a word occur once or twice, it's just the same thing. It's a yes or no. The word occurs or doesn't occur. So what's the property of not t? Not t means the word cat does not occur. So there's only one document where cat does not occur out of five documents. That probability is one by five. Let's move on. The next probability we have to calculate is the category itself. So the first two documents belong to C. The next three belong to not C. So this is very simple. What's the probability of C? It's two by five. And what's the probability of not C? It is three by five. And finally, we go to the conditional probability. So this is what's the probability that C i will occur given that T has occurred. This was the probability of C i independent of T. So we know that a probability of C is two. There are five documents. C. Uh, there are two documents belonging to category C. So it is two by five. However, when I say given T, so when I say given cat, so cat occurs in only four documents. How many of those fours belong to category C? Two. So now it's initially it was two by five. Now the conditional probability is two by four because I'm not counting document five. The reason being I am taking a conditional probability. This means that this has already occurred. So this is kind of uh, filtering my size of the my data. So this has already occurred. I'm no longer going to calculate the probability. This is a given to me. So T has occurred. It means I'm going to look at only those documents which contain T. There are four documents. Among those four, what's the probability of C? It is two, so two by four. And what's the probability of not C? Again, it's going to be uh, two by four. And the same you can uh, look at for the others as well. So for instance, for mouse, uh, doesn't occur in uh, this one. So what's the probability of C given mouse? There are two documents with mouse, document five and document three, and neither of them belongs to category C. So it is going to be zero by two, which is zero. And what's the probability that it is not C given that mouse? There are two documents, both of them belongs to not C. So this is two by two or probability is one. And same goes uh, here. And I can uh, use the other one. What's the worst probability of not a mouse? So mouse uh, occurs in two documents. So it means it does not occur in three documents. What's the probability of C? Two out of those three. So I can calculate all the probabilities that I need from this data. Alternatively, this is a visual representation of whatever I am doing. So this here is uh, this here is uh, the set of all the documents that I have. So there are n documents in total. Doc uh, category C has d documents, and uh, those documents uh, that contain t are b in number. Uh, some of them may belong to category C, some may belong to other categories. So this is an independent uh, number of documents having the word T. So having the word T or this, some of them may overlap with uh, this, this category, some may not. And those that overlap are A. So once I have this A, B, C, uh, D and N, I can simply calculate all the properties as given here. So uh, I have represented this in the form of the standard matrix. So if cat occurs, I put a one. I'm not, as I said before, I'm not counting the number of times. So I'm just a yes or no, a binary occurrence. So uh, this is uh, the resulting data set. So I have cat occurring in four of the documents. So here I can simply calculate uh, again. What's the probability of T? The probability of T, there are five documents. T occurs in four of them. So this is going to be four by five. What's the probability of not T? This is going to be one by five. There's only one document where T does not occur. What's the probability of C? This is going to be two by five because it's an independent probability. There are five documents. Two of them belong to C. So two by five. What's the probability of C given T? So given T means I'm eliminating uh, this one. I have four. Two of them belongs to C. So this is 2 by 4 and probability of C given not T. So this is the not T. And what's the probability of C? 
there is no C in this knot here, it is only knots C. So, this is going to be 0. So, once I have all these values, I can plug in for into this formula and this says summation over all m. So, first is going to be with C and then it is going to be with not C. And I plug it here and I get the information again of cat for dog and mouse. I have my three values here. Now, what is interesting to see from these values is let us look at the data visually. Let us see which uh, word, which term was most important. When I again, I am going to repeat that when I say important, I mean important in classifying the data. I am not talking about their English importance. So, let us look at the first one cat. It occurs four times. It is equally divided between C and not C. It means knowing the word cat, I am not able to decipher whether it, the new document belongs to C or not. So, for instance, if I have, uh, for instance, oops, um, let me, let me erase this and uh, excuse me. Let's try again. So, so basically, if I'm what I'm saying that I have my test document. Once I know that you know it contains the word cat, I cannot guess what the category is because cat occurs. From the training data, there are two instances of cat here and there are two instances of cat here. And we can see that uh, the information gain here is not very much. Then we have the second one, dog. So if I have uh, maybe a dog here and I, you know, I don't have this one, just this one, can I guess? Again, uh, this word occurred three times, once in cat, but not all the uh, once in C, but not all the C's. Twice in not C, but again not all the uh, not C's. So you can see that this has the least information. So among the three words, uh, this has the least information because not only is it divided between the two categories, it doesn't even occur in all the uh, instances of those categories. Uh, this has the highest information. So, this is the highest means, this is the most useful feature for me. So, if I were to know, so if this is not given to me, this is not given to me and I were to know just this, can I make a guess and the answer is yes and I will say this is not C. Why? Because mouse only occurs in documents that belong to this category, it does not occur here. So, this is a good indication for me to be able to make this classification. So, here we can see that if I had, there were three words. If I were asked to select one word, I would select this. So, there are three uh, features in total. If I had to select one, So, select one that would be mouse. If I were to select two, those will be mouse and cat. And of course, if I have to select three, then I will select all three of them. I have no choice. But if I have to delete, this is the first one I will be deleting, followed by this, and this is the most important feature for me. So, if I go back to my original. Uh, example. Yeah, if I go back to this example where I had a hundred, uh, sorry, 1000 features and I need to select only 25 feature, what I am going to do is for each individual feature, I am going to calculate the information gain, sort them and select the top 
25 by information gain this is how i'm going to select the top 25 features from my 1000 features and this is how to calculate that information gain so that was uh, one of the ways we can do the feature selection there are other ways for instance this is the mutual information or for the sake of completeness i might say this is point wise mutual information because uh, this formula here uh, does not have the probability of uh, not t it doesn't have this so since it doesn't have this it is not based on information theory so this formula for mutual information is not the uh, one based on information theory this is point wise mutual information there are other ways of calculating mutual information uh, or inf information theoretic mutual information that formula will be different so what we can do is that for uh, for a term t you can calculate the point wise mutual information because not t is not there and probability of not c is also not there so what you can do is you can calculate independently the mutual information between t and c and then between t and not c so you have two values so the first mutual information value and the second mutual information value in the case of information gain because we had uh, c and t and not t and all the uh, c's so this basically when i did the sum m was the number of classes so it automatically contains the not c here i don't have a summation so there is no not c so it means that i have to calculate the mutual information between t and c and then between t and not c i'm going to have two different values then how to figure out whether this feature is important or not i'm going to use either the average of these two or the max between these two and that will give me the uh, final so either it's going to be the average or it's going to be the max between so average of m i 1 and m i 2 or the max of m i 1 and m i 2 so this is how i'm going to figure come with a unique value for this t and so this t and then maybe this is was t1 then t2 uh, then t3 and so on and once i am done with this i will select the top features that i want and finally this is the third approach which is based on the chi square method so this is just different calculations but they're all based on the same principle you want to select the feature that is uh, the most discriminatory in nature now the next question uh, before we end this topic is uh, how do you figure out how many features do you have to select so in the example i gave i said i have a thousand features i'm going to select 25 so how do i know that 25 will be good enough for me why not 50 why not 100 why not 66 why not 82 so how do i figure out and one important way is that i can plot the graph of so this is uh, from a real data set and i'll be discussing this exact thing in the case study that we'll be doing uh, so these are the features so this is standard deviation mean average value power spectrum uh, and so on uh, these are the features that i have so there are 16 features here and for each feature i calculate the mutual information so i can see from here is that uh, this std or the standard deviation has the highest information it means uh, this is the most discriminatory in nature between the different classes then i have mean average value is the second best and so on so i'm plotting this i'm saying you know this is the highest information the next highest the next 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 and once i reach there i see there's a massive drop here and the massive drop here so if i want to keep a small number of features I'll probably make either a cut over here and keep these features or maybe make a cut over here and then keep all these features depend on 
how many features I want and this most probably will be discarded so this is my option one and this is my option two so option two already includes option one so I'm going to keep all these features and how I can do it I can uh, I can plot uh, the I can use the one two three four five six seven eight so I can use uh, I can use these uh, these eight values and plot uh, the graph of accuracy I can use eight features and then calculate the accuracy I have and then I can use 9 10 11 12 uh, 12 and then calculate the uh, accuracy I have and I can check whether using information gain or uh, mutual information or chi-square or uh, any of the other methods that I can choose so from here I know which one is the best and uh, that's the accuracy I am getting and so this from this graph I can see that you know if I choose eight features using this approach JMIM I am getting the highest classification accuracy so perhaps this is a good option choosing JMIM as the feature selection technique and using eight features so this is uh, these two graphs are independent of each other so this is not a graph that is calculated from here these are this is one of my work and this I took from the one of the papers so they are independent so don't try to relate them together don't say that this is two here and this is to no these are from different data sets and totally different things this is just for illustration that how you are going to choose how many features you have to keep and which one of the feature selection algorithm you have to use now i'm not going to go into the details of all of these uh, this is joint uh, mutual information this is minimum redundancy maximum relevance and then there are different ones uh, so what we have discussed is just one aspect of feature selection another aspect could be that uh, for instance if I had another uh, let me extend this have another feature so let me call this f of i and this also is 0 0 1 0 1 again uh, this is very similar to mouse and since mouse had a value of 0 0.42 it means this also is going to have an information gain of 0 0.42 because they are the exact same thing the next question I need to ask is if I have to select two should I select this and this because uh, if I add fi over here 0 0.42 so if I sort them it's going to be 0 0.42 0 0.42 0 0.17 and 0 0.02 so this is my f1 this is mouse uh, this is cat and this is dog so if I have to select two features these are two, two features I'm going to select but what happens if I do this only covers two documents it covers d3 it covers d5 and the three documents have no representation so if I use this it means I am discarding uh, cat and dog and then uh, some of my rows will be filled with zeros because there are two features so document one will have zero and zero I have deleted these two so basically uh, these are gone and my document one has zero and zero it means there is nothing there it's an empty feature so in this case maybe I am not going to select uh, this one or one of these and this is where that uh, uh, MRMR minimum redundancy maximum relevance it means that when I am selecting the features not only do I have to look at the information gain I am getting but also that the feature I am selecting is not similar to one of the features I have already selected so if I have selected if I have to select 25 so I select the first one the second the third fourth fifth and maybe after the sixth I am going to look at the next one I am saying okay this has the highest information gain 
but is there any feature that represents the same documents as this one? Have I selected something similar to this before? If I have, I maybe skip it and move on to the next one. Even though this has a higher information gain, I'm going to still skip it and move on to the next one. So, and there are different techniques. So what we have done is very basic uh, part of the feature selection. In reality, there's a lot of research on that, but uh, this is just a first course. We're not going into all the research, uh, but you should know that there, uh, these are the very basic ones. And in, in practice, you have a lot of more advanced feature selection techniques. For instance, I just mentioned about this MRMR. So in summary, what we have seen is we have seen the difference between a feature extraction and feature selection. So extracting the information from the data to make the features and then figuring out which features to keep and which not to keep. That's the feature extraction versus the feature selection. Then we have the unsupervised and the supervised. So term selection, where I said that, you know, just remove anything that occurs in only two documents. I didn't need any class information for that. That was an example of an unsupervised feature selection versus this information gain or mutual information or the like chi-square or MRMR. These are all examples of a supervised feature selection. And why do we do that? It's usually done to reduce the computational complexity. The size of the matrix will re reduce. The accuracy will improve. The noise will reduce. And how do we select? Uh, we select using, we can plot the graph and we just select enough but not too low. So I'll first try with seven, 8 and see if it works. So if it doesn't work only then I will go for the 9, the 10th, 11th and 12th. But if it works I will keep it at 8. So uh, select just enough but not too low. And must take care of other things like redundancy, the balance between the classes. So um, again I give you an example over here. So this is a good feature, but um, I can have this. So mouse was a good uh, feature, but it will help me in classifying new test cases that belongs to not C. What about those that belong to C? I don't have anything that helps me there. So if I had a new feature, maybe FJ that occurs over here, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 then uh, my objective would be to select one of this and one of this. So this will help me in classifying the C and this will help me in classifying the not C. So look at the redundancy, is it redundant? Look, am I giving e all the classes equal representation in terms of feature selection? So all these things have to be considered when you go to advanced feature selection techniques. And uh, finally, the criteria can be for unsupervised can be loss, minimum loss of information and for the supervised is the something that maximizes the class discrimination because you have the training set, you can look at the class discrimination. So this is uh, all about uh, the feature selection that we are going to discuss in this course. And if you are doing anything in practical life, uh, if you have the entire data set, uh, maybe you need to extract features from that data set instead of using it in the raw form. And once you extract the features, try it. If it doesn't work, it does not necessarily mean that this is the end of the world. There are many things you can try on that. You can change the classifier. You can use feature selection algorithm. You can use dimensional reduction, which we'll be discussing in the next, le next lecture. And there are several other techniques you can use. So a lot of the machine learning part uh, happens once the data is selected and then you start applying different things and see uh, which work. Um, it's not a random trial. You use your experience or your background knowledge and the theoretical knowledge why it should work and why it shouldn't work. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, it's not like you have the whole data set, try one algorithm, doesn't work and you say, no, this is not solvable. Uh, it's not like that. You can uh, significantly improve the classification accuracy by changing the algorithm, by using a different distance function, uh, maybe single linkage, if you're using unsupervised single linkage versus complete linkage, uh, using feature selection or any other pre-processing task. So it's usually uh, possible to solve for a problem that initially looked like it was not uh, very solvable. So with that, uh, I'll end this video and in the next video, we'll look at the uh, dimensionality reduction and that may involve a little bit of mathematics particularly linear algebra.
so if you have any questions you can either ask in the comments uh, you can ask me in the microsoft team or uh, you can ask me during the question our question answer session so thank you